Uh, hello and good afternoon. It's John here at UK Data Service. Um, I'd just like to welcome you all to today's webinar on licensing and governance for research data. So just a quick introduction from myself and Louise, just to explain uh, who we are. Uh, I'm John Sanders and I'm Research Support Manager uh, at the Administrative Data Service, which is based here at UK Data Service. And I'm here with Louise. And I'm the Director of Collections Development and Data Publishing here at the, the, data, the data Service. And we're um, broadcasting from Essex University in Colchester in the UK. Uh, I'm aware we've got um, a good spread of people uh, connected into today's webinar, so just thank you very much to uh, to everyone who's joined from, uh, from overseas. I appreciate it. it's not the middle of the afternoon for everyone who's listening today, so uh, hopefully it'll be a good hour session for you. Uh, just a quick acknowledgement to some of our colleagues who are helping us today with the delivery of the webinar, uh, Laura and Susan, Scott and, and Matthew, who've all contributed towards the content for today's webinar. Um, and Laura and Susan are here today uh, helping field any questions that you may have. And you should have the facility to log questions through the chat box on your webinar software. Um, we're we're going to field questions as the, um, as the webinar goes uh, and log them. And then we'll have a slot where we can address anything that comes up at, at the end, um, at the end of our sort of formal presentation. So just quickly, uh, I'll outline what we're going to cover today with the presentation, um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Louise, who's going to take us through the majority of the presentation, and then you'll hear me again at the end of the file section. So five main areas we're going to talk about. First of all, core principles of data publishing. Second, legal and ethical issues surrounding the sharing of data. Third, we'll be talking about pathways to access for data, and particularly highlighting the five safe framework, which uh, underpins an awful lot of the delivery we do here in the UK, and especially at the UK Data Service. Uh, fourthly, we'll talk about legal documentation around data sharing, governance, data licenses and access agreements. And finally, there'll be some uh, worked examples talking about the practicalities of op operating governance for data access. Uh, so I'll hand over to these for you in the first section. Okay, um, so the first part, a short part, is covering some of the core principles of data publishing. And I'm sure looking at the audience, many of you are familiar with many of the principles and you do already operate data, data publishing mechanisms, but I should just stress some of the important points. So first of all, we, we know there's many different publishing routes from the DIY to handing something out on a memory stick or a CD or publishing something online through to the trusted digital repository where we have certification and we're preserving data according to, to international standards. So there's a whole spectrum of publishing routes and uh, if you're not um, aware of it, the R3 data repository registry now contains over 1,500 repositories, which cover a huge range of um, subject areas, and you can go and browse it um, in quite a nice way. So just before we get on to some of the legal issues, there's some basic data publishing requisites. Um, so when a data set's received, there's various things that need to be done to it um, and to make it available and, um, and, and meet the needs of, of good access. So a usable format, making sure it's long-term preserved and backed up, making sure the user documentation is self-explanatory for users or as explanatory as it can be. The data needs to be non-disclosive where promised and there needs to be the rights in place to distribute. So the governance and the licensing are very important um, means to actually en enable this. And if you're not familiar with the FAIR principles, um, these are some of the basic requisites to, to meet the principles of, of FAIR data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and having a persistent identification wraps that all up nicely. So a little bit before we get onto uh, ethical and legal side is um, if you're running a repository, you do need a collections development policy of some kind. So you have a scope defined about the kinds of things you're going to accept and license and provide access to. You need a robust and auditable appraisal and selection process so that you know how to judge data and what to bring in. And that needs to be audited and recorded for, for future in case things are questioned. You need a really robust rights framework through which you can uh, bring data in and push it out again. You need to be able to manage any access, access conditions um, in a way for the longer term. And that's using a robust legal and technical framework to be able to do that. And you need to be able to store, curate and host data if you're going to choose to do that and have a preservation role through uh, a trust framework. So moving on to legal and ethical issues, we all know from social research or any kind of research involving people or organisations, we are um, generally, particularly in the UK, 
subject to ethical review. So um, not every country needs to have written consent, but we are or actually has ethical review, but the UK does and many other countries um, do too. We need to comply with the relevant laws around research conduct and also around um, copyright of material and um, around data protection. Um, we need to uphold standards of research integrity, and that's about being transparent about research methods and how we generated our data, how we're analyzing it, and how we're publishing it. And of course, we need to avoid social and personal harm when we, when we do research. So ob obviously, these are just high-level obligations. Um, as you know, in the data sharing world, there are various concerns and challenges, um, and there's concerns about appropriate reuse of data, whether that's people understanding it properly or whether they're doing the right thing with data. And then there's the challenge of personal and confidential information around normally identifiers that are hard to conceal. That could be particularly um, particular characteristics of people or places, and it could be field work locations. And of course, the more that you merge and match and link data together, um, the risk of disclosure increases. There are a number of ethical frameworks available, and actually a more recent one in the UK has been the, the, what's called the Data Science Ethical Framework, but actually it's not just around data science, it's around any principles of research. And it's issued by the UK Cabinet Office, and it gives you a set of principles to think around if you're going to do high quality research. So I'm not going to go over each of them, but um, there will be a link to this document. It's actually incredibly useful to help you make uh, kind of decisions around the different principles for, for doing ethical research. So a little bit out on personal data. This isn't a seminar about the GDPR. There's many of them available at the moment, and as are many institutions at the moment, we are working our way through implications for us, how we process data, how we make data available, the role of consent. So at, at the moment, um, we're kind of bringing in general principles, but we're not going to tell you how to do GDPR. Um, but basically it applies to researchers in the EU who process personal data about people anywhere else. And also um, it, in, it applies to people outside the, the EU who are, are collecting data and processing data about individuals within the EU. So it's quite broad. Um, it's not intended to inhibit ethical research, um, but in many ways it's felt that it does. So I think that the clarification of GDPR actually enables us to think more carefully and transparently about how, how we reuse data for research. And there's various legal gateways that are required to process and handle personal data. So uh, a couple of examples of legal gateways. In the UK, we have a Statistics and Registration Act, which dates back to 2007. And it allows the information sharing between public authorities and statistics office for, for creating national statistics. Um, there are comp uh, the rules around confidential information where disclosure of that um, and unlawful disclosure is actually a criminal offence and publishable, um, punishable by a fine or imprisonment. So that's a gateway through which we can have access to um, data from the national statistics office. And there's various processing grounds under GDPR for example, consent, public interest task, and legitimate interest, which all mean that we can actually work with personal data. And of course, they will be appropriate to the safeguards set out in, in GDPR. Little, just some high level things on data protection, because they're important um, to think about when you're, when you're creating licenses and creating access mechanisms, is that you need to be able to collecting data for uh, specific, specified purposes. The processing needs to be lawful, transparent, and fair. People have the right to be forgotten, their personal data. Um, we need to think about minimizing the size of data where we're only keeping data sets that are actually relevant. We need to think about the accuracy of information. Uh, we need to think about transfer of data, about sh sh shifting data across borders and boundaries. And we need to think about retention as well. So as I said, I'm not going to go into these, but the message is there for G GDPR is accountability, much more transparency and documentation of processes. And in, in fact, we think that will help the archival and dissemination task quite a lot. And don't forget, anonymized data or de-identified data don't fall under this legislation. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means a bit later on. So just briefly touching the form consent, um, it, it's important in the UK that research does think about gaining consent for, for, from people to do, to do research. Most research requires written informed consent in the UK. I know that's not necessarily the case in other countries, but it's important for us to think about that. 
The consent needs to identify and explain possible uses of data, which we know is a challenge, but can be done as, um, as thoroughly as possible. And the new addition there is about free, free consent on a granular level. For, for example, if you took a, a study, a long-term study, every time you collected a new piece of data, um, whether it's a survey or a test or you're collecting bloods or things, it probably needs to have a, a slightly different consent. And, and then the future governance around the data needs to recognize these individual different consents. The last thing I'm going to touch on for legal issues is copyright, because it's important when you're, when you're licensing, that individuals do have intellectual property rights over data, and that can scale up to organizations and funders. It can be quite complex, but normally in social research, there's not a lot of monetary value in the things we create, so we don't have great big laws, um, great big lawsuits like you do in the music industry, but nevertheless, there's intellectual property rights. In the UK, we have something called Crown Copyright, where material, including data created by, in, by the, the civil service and government departments that are subject to particular kind of rights. There's also database rights in the EU and the UK, which are a class of literary works, and there's, uh, um, there's a rights around the arrangement, selection, and choice of putting data together, and also the kind of structure of the database. So um, it's important to think about, in a collection of data, who owns which parts. So a little bit about access before we get onto the legal documentation. Um, we use these four pillars for uh, enabling safe access to data. Um, first of all, um, particularly in the UK, this is informed consent for long-term data sharing when we're dealing with individuals or organizations. The second one is where protection of identities have been promised, we need to do that as far as we can. Um, regulated access where it's needed, and that doesn't have to be a whole data set, it could be various parts and we can think about restricting access to various different categories. For example, a group might be that just academics can see the data, use might be, uh, use can only be non-commercial, and a time might be you might decide to put an embargo on data for a number of years, and traditionally archives have, have used embargoes quite a lot. Um, we also need to think about se securely storing personal data separately from the kind of bulk of research data. So they're, they're the four kind of principles for enabling safe access to data. We have a mantra here, and it's uh, open where possible, close when necessary, which means when we're negotiating data, we ask people to think about the various options across one data set. So bits you can open, try and open them. Bits you need to close, we'll discuss which bits they are. So we do operate a, a very simple spectrum of access. We've had this for quite a long time. I think we were one of the first archives to publish a data access policy a while back, and that was our, our director who, who came up with the three tiers, open, safeguarded, controlled. And um, I know we're talking about the word risk, and we'll come to that in a minute, but open data typically is really zero risk, probably aggregate data, really no chance of identifying anyone or anything. Um, it tends to be under an open license, and there's very little restrictions on reuse, but we can have a look at some of the license types to, to deal with this kind of data. The second type is safeguarded, and that's the majority of our holdings fit into that middle category. And this is where there's zero to very low risk. And this requires um, authentication, authorization, so typically logging on and uh, finding out um, who you are. Um, you have to sign a registered agreement that we'll talk about, and, and we'll show you how, how we do that in a minute. The safeguard it can also um, include extra conditions put upon data, depending on the nature of the, the data owner and whether they want to put additional restrictions on. And then the final category is data which really does have risk, so it is a, a risk of um, disclosing personal information. Uh, it requires project approval, which John's going to talk about later, about how you do that user vetting and training, and access via a safe haven, and, and any outputs that are checked as well. So that's three categories of, of access. We use the five safe framework uh, that was um, came up with by ONS some years ago, and we've been implementing it for quite some time. But it's a really nice, simple framework that allows us to provide safe access to data that meets, meets the needs of data protection, uh, yet it fulfills the uh, demands of open science and transparency. So the five safes are safe data, where we're thinking about treating the data to protect confidentiality. So open data would be safe, and controlled data would not be safe. Once we've decided on that, we then uh, invoke some of the other safes, and that's some um, people, making sure that our users and researchers are trusted and trained to use data safely. 
safe projects means that their projects are approved to be uh, meeting public good or whatever the demands of the data owner are. Safe settings is where we um, have a secure lab environment, which will contain data with some risk. And then safe outputs are making sure we're screening the, um, the outputs or tables or publications or text from the analysis to make sure it's not um, disclosing personal information. And if you want to have a look at our little video, we've got a three minute video that sets out how that works. So just thinking about how safe is safe, I mean, we could discuss this all day, but when it comes to data, it is a relative term. There's no such thing as absolute safety. And as you know, the more you begin to link sources together, public registers, there's so much data out there, then, then the, the safety becomes a little more tenuous. But it does involve reduction of risk. And this is in a manner acceptable to the data owner. So they are the ones that sign off the level of risk. So it's often a negotiated process and a real think about what risk means and what risk they're prepared to take. So we think of the five safes as a balancing act. So if you have open data, that's the safe data. You don't need any of the other four safes. If you have personal data, you need all the other safes to be implemented so that you're meeting the, the, the needs of um, data protection and also ethical and needs too. So it's a very nice device. Um, just to give an example of this, if you had one survey, uh, this is one of our very well-known cohort studies from the, um, the, the British cohort studies uh, going since 1958 called the National Child Development Study. You can see that it was deposited as one data set, yet we have multiple different collections uh, available under different access conditions. So there's the um, safeguarded one at the top where you just register to get that. There's a special license, which is another category where there's additional conditions placed upon that. And then finally, there's the secure access or controlled access, where there's extra variables put in that data set, which contain geographies or variables deemed to be too sensitive for the other categories. So um, not everyone can get these equally. It may be that the third one, you need to go, a lot through, go through a lot more hoops to get access to that, whereas the majority of users are pretty happy and satisfied with the first one. But it means um, there's an access pathway for a data set as it comes in, and it, and it can meet various different tiers. Just an example of a, a safe haven, there needs to be a, a demonstrated research need for more detailed data. And quite often people think they need data in that, but actually when you ask them to say why they do, they really don't know. Um, so there really is a triage process around making sure that those, those people really do need the additional variables of the geographies, and they've got a, a, a good you know, public case need, need for doing that. It's very expensive to operate um, controlled access. It's something like 30 times as expensive as just a simple registration. So it not only kind of can clog up the system, uh, it, it, we really need to know if people are, are, are trained and actually need, need to do that research. So there, the five states are invoked in this way. You have a, an approved research application, so you become a safe person. You're signed off by your institution uh, as a safe person. You um, you get face-to-face -face training. Uh, a, a, an access committee, which John will talk about later, will sign off a project as being safe. Uh, you will go into setting and use da data safely in a, a remote um, access uh, system or in a safe room, and your outputs will be checked. So that's, that's the five safes. Just moving on to licenses now. We want to just kind of show you what, what we feel is a very simple legal model. Um, we've negotiated thousands of data sets over the years. We have around 8,000 uh, collections in our, in our collection. And Susan Cadogan sitting here has been here a long time and been negotiating a licensing basis for many years. And we've seen all kinds of legal documents thrown at us saying, this is what, how I want my data licensed. And in fact, sometimes it, it's just like a lawyer's paradise in getting these things to be drafted. But we are firm believers that there is a really good model for a data set license uh, that's quite a standard license that applies to most kinds of data as a baseline. So the idea is to license your data using a, a standard license or a different kind of license that we'll talk about in a minute, um, and to make sure it's one document with various appendices in it. If you can do that through a broker, a trusted broker, then it really helps. And then there's a user agreement that the, the broker or the repository invokes with the data user. And again, these are it's a legally binding agreement to say, I'm going to use this data, and I agree to all the things you've told me to do in that agreement. Um, and therefore, there's two legal pieces of information and frameworks um, that sit there, the license and the agreement. 
what we don't um, feel is really needed, and actually what many owners, data owners, don't want to do is have a relationship with the data user. And this is how we have our, um, our relationship with the, with the, with the um, Office of National Statistics. They had hundreds of users knocking their door many years ago and decided they didn't, they, they couldn't, they didn't have the capacity to deal with research users and PhDs. So um, we became a trusted broker for them. So um, the idea really is to try and uh, get rid of the individual data sharing agreement, which can be very legalistic and difficult. And many data owners probably don't need that relationship unless they're dealing with few users. But once you're dealing with hundreds, it becomes really hard to operate that. And particularly if something goes wrong and need to invoke breach procedures, then it becomes very difficult. So having a broker to do that is really useful. So a license agreement, is, it is a legal arrangement. It's a legally binding document, and it's a contract between the uh, depositor or owner of the data and the repository. It clarifies who owns the data and whether they do have the right um, for the repository to publish it. They can, uh, a depositor can sign on behalf of someone, or someone they have permission to do that. And there's also thinking around making sure they do know if they own parts of the data or if there's any problem in there. If there's derived data sets they want to share, they need to make sure they've got copyright clearance or that there's a, an understanding of what can be republished and what can't. Um, the license agreement grants the repository a non-exclusive right to preserve and disseminate data. And that means they can have as many contracts as they want with anyone else. Um, and that's quite a useful thing to have. And then finally, it does set out what the user is allowed to do. So part of that will be showing the depositor what the end user agreements look like. And the license type should always be displayed to users so they know what, what they're supposed to do. So just an example also, having firm copyright holders and, and a license means that then you can uh, invoke a citation. So we know here that the uh, National Center for Social Research are the owners of this data, and therefore they get the citation as the ones who created it. So it enables us to have transparency around who, who's actually put the, the efforts into this. And that's done, um, the person's name there will be the, the people who signed the license. So it's like there's many other kinds of license. We're not going to go through all of them, but a common one that's actually used, that we use for some of our open data, are Creative Commons seem to have got quite a lot of popularity, um, seem to be everywhere as well. They're available in both human and machine readable forms. They're appealing because the rights are very well set out and quite easy to choose from. But one has to be careful because um, if you choose one, they're not actually revocable. So if you disseminate something under the license terms in a Creative Commons license, even if the owner decides to change their mind and stop distributing, the user's still got a right to use it. So just think carefully about the kinds of use license you want to use. It is a bit of a minefield. There's lots of different kind of adaptations and types. And just to give an example, because it's a very clear way of, of um, presenting this, there's various clauses in there around attribution. So the user needs to attribute data. Share alike, the materials can only be shared if they're in the same kind of flavor. Some don't allow any derivatives or um, de derivations of data. Some allow only non-commercial usage. And then there's various different combinations of those. So the ones that we tend to use are attribution. We always have attribution in our data, uh, the ones using Creative Commons. And non-commercial or commercial, depending on what the, the data owner wants. And that really does mean, commercial does mean selling data. It doesn't mean having data used in a book or on a television program. It, it does mean kind of um, selling and marketing of data. There's a nice license selector out there. I think there's more than one where you can work through the different scenarios and things you want to do, either for software or data, and you can go and have a look at those later. But I just want to talk about what we use here because we do, we do use a variety of license types. Our first one is a kind of grander one, and that's um, a much bigger document. In fact, it's a very, very long document with lots of appendices. And it's called a concordat, and it sets up a formal relationship and a contract with a government department. And in this case, it's our national statistics offices, for example, Office of National Statistics and the ones in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And that means there's a, an annual review of the relationship between us. Uh, for example, when ONS create a, a social survey, we get access to the data in a timely manner and we, we make it available in a timely manner too, which means there's a really nice flow of national statistics um, microdata to, to users. Uh, and, it, and it seems to work very, very well. And we are building concordats with other government departments because it's a nice way to share data. 
Um, and then there's the open data licenses. Uh, we don't have that many data sets, but it tends to be aggregate, aggregate data sets, teaching data that are kind of cut down versions of bigger surveys, or some historical collections where we know the people are definitely dead and they can go open. And then there's our standard license, which is used for almost all of ours, and that deals with the safeguarded and controlled data sets. And it also allows the owner, the data owner or copyright holder, to define the access uh, clause. So you saw the three-tiered open, safeguarded, controlled. They can choose which route they want. And any, um, any specific things they want to talk about in there, it could be vetting of publications, which is quite rare, but it, it can be done, can be set up in an appendix. So standard four, four to five pages, and then other things can be put at the end. Um, and it's, it is preferable than trying to negotiate a brand new legal agreement um, with lawyers, because that can take a long time. So just as an example, um, I'll have an end user agreement, standard terms and conditions, it's legally binding, it's actually click use. And then there's additional terms and conditions that can be placed upon data. Sometimes you click through to agree them. Sometimes they require you to submit an application which needs to be approved by the data owner or a committee. And other times there's a secure access where you need application form and you need training. So there are various different ways of, of dealing with different conditions on the license. And just to, just to say briefly, most user agreements around data cover broadly the same things. There's, I think something like 18 clauses in there. But at high level, you've got issues around security and storage, making sure you don't like, try to identify people, making sure you're keeping data safely and you destroy it according to best practice. Research integrity, if you do find errors, report them because it's really useful for the next user. Um, use them only under the conditions agreed, so don't try and sell data when it's a non-commercial license. Report any non-compliance that, that you know about, make sure you cite data, and do accept that any non-compliance will lead to penalties. So that's kind of around good practice. And then finally, they have to agree that personal data collected about them can be used for service purposes, and that's very useful to have that in, in the agreement as well. So controlled data, very similar things to agree, but a little bit more. So because they're analyzing data in a safe setting and they're undertaking their analysis in there, they have to access personally identifiable data. They have to agree to conditions for handling personal data, and they have to agree to an extra set of breach penalties, and they do need to agree to be trained as an approved researcher. So there's a few more things they need to agree to. And in this case, the institution has to countersign rather than just the user. So it's a more complex agreement and it takes a bit longer, but that's because we, we have a legal gateway to go through. A little bit of non-compliance. It's very important to have a non-compliance policy and we do have a managing um, license compliance. And that sets out all the kinds of things and the kind of um, scaling up of penalties that might happen. So the very smallest thing would be that you're not having access to data anymore, and maybe permanently, maybe temporarily, depending on the on the crime. Um, and then you might have the suspension of um, institutional individual um, data service, access to data services, or even funding. And if you're accessing data under the Statistics Act, uh, there may be a, a, a big fine or there might be a prison sentence. So one has to be very careful. So um, there are sometimes breaches, but they're normally really minor, unintentional, accidental breaches. And when, we, when they're self-reported, um, then maybe they need to be approved again or retrained. But they're normally things like accidentally well, copying information from a screen or looking over someone's shoulder in, in a secure lab. So they're normally things that actually are unintentional and can be corrected. Um, and that's a positive thing. We haven't had any major breaches. I'm now going to pass over to John around some of the practicalities of operating data access because it does require human effort, technical effort, um, and it doesn't happen by itself. Right, thank you very much, Louis. So um, really the sort of the final section is just to sort of illustrate some of the uh, practical arrangements uh, and some of the thinking about service delivery, about how you enact some of the principles that Louise has talked about there. Um, <clears throat> So really this comes about down to um, how you do this, uh, this process of actually uh, handling an application. I'm really going to focus in on a particular strand just to be able to illustrate, um, illustrate some of the practical things that you have to do, some of the actual working arrangements. Um, obviously there's consideration, you can kind of deal with this uh, as a spectrum in terms of how you enact what are those principles. You can think about who it is that's going to look at 
granting permission for access, um, and you can you can take different sort of different sort of um, you can put in place different solutions for that. Whether it's about having individual people who have sign off on data, or whether you have quite structured mechanisms, uh, not to uh, preempt what's going to come, but I'm really going to talk about uh, to demonstrate all the practicalities. Really, sort of focusing on how you use a data access committee really to discharge that kind of function. And you can see there, just to highlight, there are kind of some things to think about when you establish the practical government arra governance arrangements about are you creating single points of failure? Uh, is there clarity in your process? Um, is it clear to people that have to come on and apply what exactly they have to, what exactly they have to do to, to gain access? The whole example here really is looking at that controlled access, and it is the top end um, in terms of governance and, and rigor, um, it is the most service intensive and it's the most difficult and sort of time consuming for applicants to get through. So there are elements of this which may sort of uh, cascade down to data that doesn't require so much rigor, um, and you can think about that. But it's easier to talk about sort of the the whole and complete picture of the most rigorous way of doing things, and then uh, take what from, take from that what you need if necessary. Really important point to make is that um, although it's very good to be clear about arrangements and uh, have them well defined, um, they may need to change over time because they may be dependent on context and circumstance. And so, uh, it's not that things uh, don't have variation, the, the opportunity for variation of flexibility. But what's really uh, important about governance is it's uh, enacted in a consistent and uh, a reliable way as much as it can. So just to pick up on the uh, the five safes model that Louise has already talked about, what I'm really going to focus on here is the uh, the safe project strand of things and how governance is enacted around that. Um, and it's probably worth pointing out that although some of the language that's used about this around things like, say, approved research as a gateway to project use, um, there is really a kind of uh, a possibility to draw a distinction between how we think about the governance and approval around the people doing research and how we think about the governance and approval around projects and the research uh, intention in and of itself. And so I'm really going to focus on the, uh, the project application journey and that the governance around that. So um, there are a few different names uh, for the kind of the body that normally handles project applications within uh, a data research governance process, but I'll refer to them as a data access committee through this. And it's just a brief definition just to kind of explain what that really looks like in practice. So basically, it's a process where um, a group of people are actually looking at individual applications that are proposed to use uh, for projects that are proposed to use data. Uh, and collectively come into a decision about whether to grant that access or not. As I said, it's the most time and resource intensive way really to govern data access, and so it needs to be reserved for those situations that really warrant that kind of uh, level of scrutiny um, and that amount of diligence. It is a useful mechanism for situations where there are a lot of complex factors to consider because you've got a number of people around the table, so to speak, they can really consider different dimensions that might apply to whether or not access should be granted. Uh, particularly if there are certain perspectives you need to bring, um, and I'll talk about membership in a moment, or if there are very difficult decisions to make that are quite subjective. It's easy to think about this as being kind of applicable in situations where data sensitivity is very applicable, um, or where there's very sensitive data and there's got to be a lot of caution around allowing access. Um, but there might be some other things that drive you into using this kind of um, solution as well. So if you're in a situation where your service will actually um, kind of have a lot of overhead in granting access and facilitating it, you might want to um, think carefully about how much kind of work you take on that. And then again, if you've got data which in, in itself is actually finite and there's only so much of it available, for example, you've got biosamples, you might want to think about uh, ensuring you don't have duplication of use or you're having usage of data in ways that means there's sort of greater potential for further reuse in the future. So I'll just walk through um, the sort of setup, preparation, and operation of a, a data access committee, uh, just to illustrate all the thinking that needs to happen around this, really. So there are sort of five key things about setting up a, a DAC um, that needs to be in place. And the first and most obvious one of those really is um, having a decision-making framework that um, on which access decisions are based. And so there's a link through here to uh, the criteria that apply when ONS will make a decision to grant access under research for example and it's really positive if you can be really clear about what that criteria against which any application is going to be judged are uh, both because it helps people apply and for, for sort of 
external transparency. It's also very helpful if you can be clear about what kind of thresholds need to be reached, such things to be approved or under which things will be rejected. But it, it might not be easy to be that clear because of the subjectivity, maybe, of some of the judgments that are, that are being made. Um, thinking about the remit of the decision-making framework, it's also important for any committee to think about how it relates to any other kind of decisions that are going on um, around research projects. So the most obvious and easiest to illustrate is where you've got a requirement in academia, say, for ethical review. Uh, you need to make sure there's awareness in your process of, of the other process and how the two interact, uh, whether there are any dependencies. We don't want to be getting into a position where you're creating a decision-making uh, process which is replicating or contradicting something that's been done elsewhere in a really robust and solid sense. In practice, you need to think about who is who sits as part of this uh, committee, this panel. Um, Having a single person making decisions is a, is a big risk for resilience. Um, you may need to have a range of different people involved in arriving at the decision. And it's likely that your membership is going to reflect the criteria for the assessment and what kind of uh, issues are being taken into consideration when uh, approval is, is granted or not. So potentially uh, people who have specific knowledge of the, the data or the research area, potentially people who are representative of um, the data subjects, lay members potentially, if you're going to look at public benefit as a criteria potentially, it's all then worth worth thinking about. You do need to consider as well that this whole mechanism will need supporting and staffing with some sort of secretariat just to run the thing and, and to make sure it operates uh, effectively and correct and uh, efficiently. The final thing to establish when, when you're in the setup phase really is what kind of material you're going to put in front of the panel to allow them to make decisions about individual projects, so most obviously some sort of application form or process that will allow applicants to say what it is they want to, uh, what data is they want and what they want to do with it, but there might be reports or assessments that from within the service you wish to produce that will accompany um, those, those applications and give some sort of context or commentary. So in terms of um, service functions to support it that there are a number of things that will have to happen before a meeting uh, can take place and uh, the committee can actually consider applications. So the most obvious thing is to have a good slick uh, application form that captures the right information for the DAC to allow them to make uh, a, a nice and easy decision uh, based on good evidence. Um, obviously the application form will do very well to be tailored towards the decision making criteria of the DAC and to present the information in a way that's both uh, easily intelligible, but it's also clear. Um, in that sense, it's really helpful if you can have a system that's based around something with online forms, for example, just because it allows you to automate a lot of the work to support um, applicants in inputting the right information in there. And then there are two stages to the service, both kind of uh, react proactive and reactive to support people who are individually in there trying to make applications against these data. I've linked there through to a couple of documents produced by NHS Digital, some, some web content, which really is guidance to people who are applying in uh, to help them refine and establish their application uh, and give it the best chance of meeting the requirements um, um, of assessment and allow the panel to judge it. There is obviously also, and uh, Louise did mention this earlier, sort of some level of manual effort from within any given service that's supporting ADAPT to screen and triage applications that are coming in. And really, you want to be able to help people when they're inquiring about the access to data, potentially uh, signpost them to alternative, less disclosive data sources if that's appropriate. Make sure you don't have people going through a governance process when they really don't need to. And also help screen the applications they put together to uh, assist them in addressing any obvious uh, errors or omissions, potentially, in the application they have put, put, put together. Just to kind of highlight the importance of this, really, I'm just uh, on this slide pointing out some of the key information which invariably you're going to have to have probably in any project application, uh, just to make sure as a basis you're capturing the right information. So obviously a description of the project uh, in itself, but probably something quite concise and intelligible, something that's very clearly laying out the data uh, required, potentially where there's any data linkage, um, the ways, the years, the, the variables required. And importantly, a justification of why that data is required for that purpose. So you can sort of see the, um, the 
so the applicant is basically able to demonstrate their confidence in the fact that that's what they need to be able to get the outcome they, uh, they require. Also useful to capture some information about the team doing the work so you can sort of understand the intention uh, and the background and potentially whether it's been through other, other processes like peer review um, in order to be able to progress as a sort of project. So you can potentially refer in your DAC process back to kind of assessments that have been made of that project further uh, earlier in its sort of lifetime as a project has evolved. At this point, obviously, as a service, you can also be collecting some key information um, about the service they, these applicants are actually going to require, where their data access will happen, uh, when it will happen, how many people. And, and to an extent, this relates through to some of the um, some of the functions you'll need to carry out about uh, approving of individual researchers as well. Um, final point here, one of the key things really is to understand what kind of output is going to be produced from doing the research work and that's very helpful both from a service point of view so you can understand what kind of output checking will be required but also to uh, for the panel to be able to understand sort of the purpose and outcome of allowing access to the data. So in practice there's a, a few key things to think about for operating a DAC. Uh, the most obvious thing really is a cycle of meetings so that um, or some kind of cycle within which the panel consider individual applications that are coming forward. And that will really need to be tailored and respond to a number of factors, so the volume of work that's coming through the DAC, uh, potentially reflecting timescales of other dependent processes um, would allow you to establish kind of a pattern to your own access committee. Obviously, the ability of the Secretariat to support the DAC and potentially the commitment and availability of the different members who are making up the panel themselves. The method of actually operating the committee could be different. It could be uh, it could be virtual. It could be face to face. You probably need to think about what's most appropriate for your uh, scenario. Uh, it might be that you want to, if you're establishing a DAC, uh, start off with something that's slightly more intensive and more face to face, so it beds down the operation, then move to potentially more virtual um, ways of operating. Equally so, there are a range of different options about how you actually put information in front of this committee um, and present the information to them they need to then make their decision on. This can range from simply tabling paperwork to them or circulating by email beforehand, uh, having some sort of present formal presentation with some advocacy from the service who supported the application development, or potentially through to the applicant themselves being able to present direct. And there are pros and cons to these different uh, these different ways of dealing with this um, and it's worth sort of considering what's going to be most suitable. I mean one of the most obvious things that will happen with, with any access committee is they may not be able to from their first pass at an application decide to whether to approve or not. So they may need more information and it's probably there when you need to think about if there are different ways to deal with that kind of workload through uh, email correspondence within the committee or, or potentially phone calls to applicants, that sort of direct communication. The final outcome from the committee really is their, their decision, which ultimately does come down to approval or rejection. Um, and there'll need to be communication of outcomes both to the applicant themselves, and they'll probably have a fairly keen expectation about a quick turnaround of a response, um, but also um, probably some thought to be given to where you publish those outcomes more widely. Uh, very helpful from a transparency point of view to be clear about what decisions to approve or not are, are made and what the reasons for those are. Um, and so there's a link through there to the register that NHS Digital again published for all their dissemination of data. And it's it's really helpful to be able to be transparent about data releases uh, full stop. Um, there are a different, range of different ways of, of doing it. So obviously from a a researcher's point of view, really, the interesting it stops when the governance uh, really comes to an end and they can use the data to do their work. Um, but there are a few final governance steps to think about after access is complete and when you know research outputs have been produced. Obviously, there's disclosure control and output checking. That's very much a service uh, element provided by data brokers like Data Service to kind of keep in some kind of control around what data ultimately gets released from secure access type. Uh, environments. Potentially there is a role for data access committees back here as well where um, if there's a want to bring back the actual outputs for final approval um, 
by the data owners themselves, or given that's um, maybe not a very open uh, sort of restraint put on the use of data. It might be that data owners are particularly keen just to be aware of the outcome of research so they can be prepared for the point of publication for any sort of inquiries about the, uh, the, uh, the findings emerging from use of their data. Um, it's also very it's also very important really when earlier in the application process we've looked at um, commitments by the applicant about what it is they're going to do and what kind of outputs they're going to produce and disseminate from their uh, research potentially to sort of lead to things like potential public benefit or commercial exploitation to be able to track that back and see what the ultimate outcome was from the data use. So it's a very whistle-stop tour through some practical um, elements of uh, running governance processes. Louise, I'll just hand you yeah, back to um, summarise that. Yeah, final slide, then we'll take some questions. So just in summary, just a, a few points to take away. Um, we need to treat the data or deal with the kind of personal data disclosure risk in there to maximise opportunities for use. We can check the data for rights issues prior to publication. We need to think about using standardised licences. A clear data access policy um, that reaches the spectrum of access, uh, spectrum of access is really, really uh, desirable. Setting up methods for enabling the access using the five safes. Making sure the application processes where you do have data behind a gate are fair and transparent. Using uh, end user agreements that are standardized. Enabling access to disclosive data if, if you can through legal gateways if you, if you need to do that and then providing accountability across the life cycle. And that's good documentation, good um, auditing, and particularly if you're using the five safes and, and safe havens, there's an awful lot of auditing that you'll, you'll need to go through. So that's just a summary of some of the, the points. Um, yes, we will be making the slides available as a recorded webinar, a webinar and also available as a PDF uh, set of slides on our past events, and we can send you the, the links for those. There's an awful lot of resources on our website from data management to advice on uh, deposit, uh, copies of our license, our data access policy, all those things are hopefully as transparent as they can be. Um, and also we've agreed with the um, University of Glasgow, and I think Valen McCutcheon's on, on the line, we're going to run a, um, a day on the practicalities of licensing and governance in the autumn together, because we think um, there's a lot of demand for this kind of thing. And working through examples and templates, I think, is uh, appealing to to some people who like the intricacies of this area. So uh, we've got various websites and uh, Twitter streams um, and things that you can um, keep connected with what we do. We run a whole program of webinars on lots of different topics. And um, thank you very much um, for listening. And um, we're going to now invite some questions. So I'll just kind of coordinate the questions a bit. Thank you for sending them in. And thank you, Marta, for um, being asking us lots of difficult questions. I'm going to start the first one, the retention. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Susan Cadogan, who will just cover that one for you. Um, OK, I hope you can hear me OK, Tom. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, as an archive, we have a role for long-term preservation and curation. Um, um, so we take materials into the collection, into the archive, um, in perpetuity. Um, and many archives will have this arrangement and will have successor arrangements in place should um, they cease to exist. Um, there's, a, there's sort of two strands to this. So there's the archival role and there's also the data collected in order to undertake the research project initially anyway. And um, this depends on the purpose, how, how long you keep it, depends on the purpose, whether you want to re-interview the participants of your doing a longitudinal study as well. We, and you have a duty to hold any personal information safely and for no longer than is necessary. And whether or not the data that you're holding is personal will depend on whether or not it applies, that GDPR rules apply to it. Um, I hope that's answered your, your question. Um, obviously, we can get back to you in, in greater detail if, if you'd like. I think there's a lot to talk about 10 years. I don't think it comes from anywhere particular. It tends to be a rule of thumb that's used, and often it's used by universities. So there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to think about whether you've got a longer-term preservation role and whether it's personal data or not, because yes. the different rules will apply. Um, so, yes, hopefully, if, if there's any more clarity, we can um, 
we, we can get back to you, Marjorie, on that. But it, again, there's no hard and fast rules apart from if you're collecting personal data, make sure you're doing it according to the law. Uh, colleague Scott has replied and said that the, the five to ten year statement is often something Rex yeah. to reduce. Yeah, yeah. Which can, which can be helpful. Um, and there's another couple of questions on DAX. I'm going to bring them together. So we've asked if um, what uh, whether we ourselves run a DAC uh, for controlled data. No, no, we don't because that's not really our role. Um, we could run a DAC on behalf of depositors, and actually we are part of some DACs. We don't run one ourselves, and most of the people having controlled access already have a decision-making body or committee that meets regularly, um, and it depends on the size, but they tend to meet every month or so and review applications. So um, there's no reason why you couldn't convene one, but you, you may want to think about who actually is responsible for doing this and who the ultimate owner of the data is. It is very important, though, to think about, because what the data service does do is provide that sort of secretariat and supporting function to enable the DAC to work, handling applications, ensuring that um, only, uh, only sort of useful business goes forward to the data provider, so it acts as a kind of filter yeah. there, and it is very important to be working closely with the DAC in itself to establish the right kind of kind of screening and triage mechanisms to make that work well. And just to say that can be an awful lot of work because the detail needs to be there for them to make the decisions. So um, it's really important that, that some human is screening it beforehand. And quite often you'll have somebody presenting the case, and they they need to have a really really good handle on it. Um, what proportion of our data are controlled? We think it's a, a very small proportion, actually. It tends to be additional variables on top of the data sets we have. I think it's something like 30 to 40. Um, and they're all managed by a data access committee. You have to have approval through a formal approvals panel committee for all of these data sets. And they're normally run by the agency or the, for example, for the longitudinal studies where we have additional variables. They're run by a data access committee at the cohort study center. And they meet every month, and they're made up of the owners of the survey and various other experts. And as I said, we actually sit on that one to help help make decisions about disclosure risk. Um, let's have a look. We would never just have controlled access. We would normally try and make sure we've got a safeguarded data set as well, because otherwise you're really limiting the number of people who can go in. Because at the moment, it tends to be um, people who've got the analysis skills, who maybe have done academic work particular kinds of users. So certainly at the moment, we don't let undergraduates or master's students in to use those data sets. So again, it's quite restrictive putting everything under, under control. Um, do you want to do the top one, Sue? The, yeah. Uh, another, can researchers from outside the UK deposit data with UK data service? Yes, they can. We offer, um, we have, we run an, offer an appraisal process. Um, I can send links to the information to you to follow. And there's no cost, but we would think very carefully about whether it's worthy and has enough value for us to um, put it through our controlled access mechanism. And again, it goes back to having various access levels of data sets in the collection, because most people will want to use an end user version, and specialist users will want the controlled access version, and it does have in-house in in costs associated with access to controlled access data. data. Collection. So one of the criteria for deciding on appraisal whether that would go to controlled access would be the amount of people wanting to use it already and whether there's a big demand for it. Yeah. Um, if there wasn't, we probably likely would, wouldn't do that. But I'm um, data, the, the intricacy of the information that's contained in there as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to answer the one on streaming data. Yes, we have are having experiences with live streaming data. We're actually running with UCL and setting up a smart meter research portal which will stream in live data from households for, for, I don't know how, forever, I think, or some, as long as the, the service is in place. And there's quite a few issues that are raised. Um, not only kind of ownership and consent, because with things like smart meter data, it's actually the householder who owns the consent. So you need very explicit consent about what can be done with that. So clarifying consent around these kinds of data. Um, how you're going to deal with ingesting that or streaming it on a daily basis whether you've got the, the technologies in place to be able to do that. We're actually set up a Hadoop system to be able to handle such large amounts of uh, column data. Then also thinking about the curation role, how do you do that? Uh, and then also for publishing it, how do you add citations to that? Is it around the chunks when people take bits away? Or are you timestamping it every day, every month, every week? 
and giving citations. So there's quite a lot of issues around that. Um, and yes, we are working on all of these things at the moment. We're working on the licence. And of course, the licensing side and the governance and ethics, it will need epic because smart meter data and streaming data is only often useful when you begin to link it to other personal household attributes. Um, this will be available in a controlled access environment and it needs licensing and it needs governance and it needs access, data access committees and everything. Okay, anything else? Yeah, but we are actually working on our um, license agreement at the moment. We have a question about whether or not we're revising our license to reflect GDPR needs and we are working on it and hopefully we'll have something to um, share shortly. We will be upgrading our um, data management deposit information um, with GDPR compliant license form, license um, end user agreement and, and website around um, this whole area. Uh, we've got a team on that at the moment. Um, we're not ready to do it now because everyone, we're still having meetings with funders and things like that, but um, we certainly want to, to advertise when we do have it. So please watch your space. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at the top one. Are there special specifications for research space in non-UK for data request and access? Do you want to answer that one? Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so there's, well, there's different specifications for different data sets. So, uh, for example, uh, data, secure access data, which can only be accessed in the secure lab, can only be accessed in the UK. Uh, so non-UK users would need to, you know, have a, be a visiting researcher or something like that at a UK institution. Um, otherwise, special license data sets, uh, a lot are available anywhere um, in the world, but there are some that are limited just to the UK. Um, and then EUL data, the end user license data, mostly it's just available once you're registered. So, you know, you can be a, a user from outside the UK and use that. Yeah, I mean, anyone can register free with our data service. Yeah. Mostly the data sets used for non-commercial purposes. So mm -hmm. as long as you can, uh, you can justify, you know, your, your project and, and they're not going to be selling data, then you can come and use it because it's all mostly downloadable data. We do issue credentials as well to get into our system. We do have a federated access, so people who are part of um, UK universities can join easily. But if you don't have those credentials, we can issue those, yeah, um, and then right. you can become a registered user quite easily. And we do have users from all over the world uh, using data. I think we're probably coming to a close. Is there any more questions? Yeah, I think I think we've covered all the questions. Have we? I think. Okay, so there's a question around teams that dissolve. This is something that John covered actually, because we've been archiving and, and sharing data for 50 years. You know, people 30 years ago said, "Well, do I want to know who's using it. I'm going to give permission." You asked me. Of course, within 10 years, they've retired or gone. It's not really sensible to have an individual as a person giving permission. So we try to guard against that and say, please, either delegate to someone else who's going to be longer than you, or your institution can give permission. But actually, there does need to be some perpetuity around a DAC, and that needs to be built in. So it would be up to the department, I guess, or the university. I think every institution actually um, handles it differently. In a couple of cases, the depositors, they have been devolved to us with, with um, really old oral history studies. Sometimes I, um, because I was involved in the study, can, can kind of make a decision myself. But more often than not, either we try and renegotiate away the conditions so it no longer needs permission, which might mean rethinking about the data, or if it's a lot of years later that people might be dead anyway. So we, we've had a, a large program of negotiations to make sure a lot of these bespoke vettings are not in place. Um, but it could be done anyway. I would suggest probably a central department or somebody with a, a curation role in the institution could do that. But it, it can be devolved if you wanted to. Um, it's really up to the data trying to decide what they want to do. And that probably would be some kind of contract to put them as the copyright holder in there to make a decision. And I think it's also worth thinking about, um, sort of as I said really, is the DAC model really necessary for this situation if you've got something that's quite transient in terms of collecting the data, was there the, the depth of potential for reuse to really justify 
go into that really rigorous governance for it? Would it be more effective, if, especially if these sorts of problems are anticipated about being able to go back to associated people? Is it better just to think really from a service point of view, let's have something that you don't have to put that level of, of rigor around. There will still be plenty of opportunity for reuse if we can put the data into a situation where it's safeguarded or where it's controlled. And it, so sorry, safeguarded or open, it doesn't have to have that level of control around it. Okay, I think we've covered all the questions that come to the end of our session. So um, we want to thank you very much for listening to us and hope we've answered your questions. And again, feel free to mail us offline if you want to ask any more. We will try and summarise some of the questions and put them as, a, as an FI, a FAQ. And we will make we will we'll make them available as well. So um, thank you very, very much. Um, and we hope to see you at another webinar or an event. <laughs> okay? Bye. Thank you very much.